we are at the end of 1995 and the middle of Nintendo Power's eighth year, and we have a big N64 reveal. We're also light on a lot of other stuff because the games are either not out yet, out of scope for the show, or stuff we've already covered because we're approaching the end of a console generation, so there's that going on. Let's get started. Our cover game of this issue is Donkey Kong Country 2 with another pre-rendered still. I've already reviewed this game, so that's one less game I'm covering this issue. In our letters column, we get a prompt for Dream Games, or had one prompt for them previously, and we start off with a request for a compilation of Final Fantasy 1 through 3. Well, we got Dawn of Souls with 1 and 2, so you're almost there. I think we've got a compilation with 3, though. Yes, I know what they actually mean is a compilation of Final Fantasy 1 for the NES and then 4 and 6, but still. In the power charts, NHL 96 is new to the Super Nintendo Top 20, along with Mega Man 7, and for some goddamn reason, Batman Forever. Killer Instinct for the Game Boy is new to that platform's rankings, and the genre rankings this time are for Team Sports games. And also, the Virtual Boy rankings still persist, at least for a while. Nintendo's Space World is happened by the time of this release, so we have the unveiling of the N64 controller. So let's talk about that. This is the controller for the Nintendo 64. There are several big shifts from a design standpoint from earlier ones. First off is the general shape. The three-prong design, Freudian implications aside, right out of the gate changes how you use the controller. Now, you can, of course, hold it like most traditional controllers to date. I'm going to hold it backwards so you can kind of see it. I'm going to be kind of ad-lib about this. I have general notes together, but you can hold it like traditional manner. Um, or you can hold it with one hand in the center and then one hand on the other side with your thumb on the analog stick and your forefinger on the Z-trigger at the underside of your controller. Now, it's actually worth mentioning something about this button placement. Um, because, first off, the Z-Trigger is a very new thing. Well, the Z-Trigger both the analog stick are new things. Um, but when you're demoing this unit, from having experience with playing this in demo kiosks, um, it's, um, these were hardwired in the unit with a little fixed rigid thing holding it in place, so you could not turn the unit over to see that the Z-Trigger was there, with assuming, of course, you well, if you didn't know what the Z trigger was and that had it, and which also leads to another little issue with this, actually, as far as for the, the one handed, um, one hand in the middle, one hand on the side thing is if you look at the button layout on here, you'll notice that there it's almost ambidextrous but not quite. Um, the C buttons on the Right hand side of the controller. This isn't, by the way, the launch in. It did not launch with the translucent uh, controller. It came out later. Uh, when translucent electronics were a big thing in the 90s. Um, the C button use, has a D pad esque layout. So it's almost mirrored on the other side, but not quite. It's also, the start button is in the middle, either for both versions, but there's no select button. So, again, you got the. So you don't have anything replicating on the D-pad side, the A and B buttons, which means it's not partic. Which means it this could have been an ambidextrous controller, but it's not. Um, at this point, you had the Atari Lynx, which was designed to be an ambidextrous handheld system, but otherwise, most controllers didn't really do that. The N64, rather the Super Nintendo kind of could, where you had the how the um, D-pad and the face button layouts work. You could kind of work something like that, but not really. This is probably the closest to doing something similar, but even then, not quite, because the C buttons are not a proper D-pad with intermediary inputs on them like you get with the, the actual proper D-pad on here. But yeah, so there's that. Um... Again, it's, it, it's, uh, that's a minor bummer. Um, the analog stick could wear out a lot. Uh, that said, 
In fact, it's not too unreasonable to find N64 controllers on the aftermarket these days with worn-out D-pads. This is actually a replacement um, analog stick on this one. I installed a replacement when I got this. Um, depending on the model of analog stick, um, you can, it can be a, it's a fairly straightforward process. Some of them have... Some replacement analog sticks out there don't actually have the proper connector that goes with the little Molex thing that goes into the board. Um into the circuit board, so that's a little obnoxious, but otherwise not too it's not too hard to find one that has all the connectors set up and it's like a couple screws. Pretty straightforward on that front. Anyway. Um so because these the, the two different configurations, you have different games that have different configurations. Um, which makes it tricky to communicate what orientation or what you're supposed to use for what games. And when I was a kid, uh, the N64 came out. And this actually caused problems for me because I was, at the time, my mother was working at Toys R Us. And so I would spend a bunch of time there and the Nintendo 64... Uh, demo kiosk was near where she was working at the customer service counter. So I spent a whole bunch of time at that. And I never got the hang of this controller, really. Because, because of how it was hardwired into the unit, I could never see the Z trigger. Which, when GoldenEye 64 came out, the... Um, that depends on the Z trigger for and in the analog stick for moving and shooting. So that's that's a problem. This is aggravated by the other significant de design decision with the N64, which is the decision to stick with cartridges. So with demo you, with the PlayStation, you had demos. You had Demo discs coming out with PlayStation Magazine and other similar things all the time. And in stores at their demo kiosk units, they would have a demo CD in there with a variety of custom-built game demos along with the front end, which, as the game was loading off of the disc, would present you with the controls for the game so you know what buttons did what. Now, maybe it loaded a little too quickly, for you to be able to properly read them, particularly if the game was already in memory, because people had played that particular game a lot, like, for example, the Tekken demo. But that there was a way to surface that information presented to the player. The N64 demo units, on the other hand, were just the cartridge. They were just the GoldenEye cartridge, or the Mario 64 cartridge, or the Shadows of the Empire cartridge, or whatever, just stuck in the unit, with the unit having a time limit on it, or after a certain number of amount of time had passed, the unit would automatically restart. And it would do so by cutting the power and turning it back on. Um, and so you couldn't make it particularly into any of the any of the games or anything like that to reach a save point. Um, so that helped keep from having a save slot on the game necessarily. But because of this, because of the setup, you didn't have a control scheme surfaced to the player on the demo kiosk, so you did not get the information of, do I play the game like I played every other video game I've played in my life to date? Or do I play it in this new manner that I've never seen a video game played before, using these new features on this new controller that I've never encountered before? Ultimately, like, I don't hate the N64 controller design, at least not yet. But it could definitely be more intuitive. Now is a good time as any, by the way, to point out one fact. This is not a USB N64 controller. This is a commercial one. When we start getting into capturing N64 games, um, I have an actual N64 and it's for hardware, and I have gotten a EverDrive. So what does this mean for the show? This means that I will be capturing N64 gameplay footage off of actual N64 hardware with the Eon 64 HDMI attachment or adapter to upscale things. So that is, once we actually start getting into N64 games, that is what you will be seeing. 
Getting into the actual games, we have expanded coverage of Donkey Kong Country 2 with level notes, but no maps for each world. Again, I've reviewed this, I'm not going to review it again here. We get a whole bunch of screenshots for Earthworm Jim 2, along with heaping loads of play praise on Gamer Gator, an ambulatory pile of human garbage, Doug Ten Naple, which makes the whole thing kind of awkward to talk about now. As it is, since the game isn't out yet when this issue came out, I'm going to hold off on my review until we get a more prominent feature article post-release or um, level maps. Next up is Wario Land for the Virtual Boy, which is probably the best game for the system. There's notes on Wario's different hats and a whole bunch of level maps. Moving on, we have the uh, Super Nintendo Waterworld game, which has vehicle and platforming stages, and a whole bunch of level maps of the game. However, doing some searching as I was preparing for this issue, it appears that this game actually did not get a US release. It did come out in Europe, but that would be a PAL release with a different frame rate that comes with it, which makes things weird. You want to play it on modern cons, um, play it in the US, so I'm holding off on this. In the Epic Center News column, we learn that the Super Mario RPG has been delayed and there's no word of a current release date. Our strategy guide coverage of Secret of Evermore continues, and as I've already reviewed this game, I'm going to hold off on additional coverage again. We have the sequel to Pacific Theater of Operations, Koei's first, well, the, Koei's second World War II strategy game. Well, technically, actually, third, yes, or the second sequel to Koei's first World War II strategy game. There we go. As I mentioned previously, these games are very, very opaque without a manual. It doesn't have the level of grand strategy elements in terms of marriages and allegiances and alliances and that sort of thing that you get with, you know, your uh, Romance of the Three Kingdoms and your Nobunaga's Ambitions. But I'm going to stick with my standing recommendation that these games are most worth playing, that you can get documentation or a really good fact or wiki that explains the mechanics, and you sit down and read them thoroughly before you play them. They are still good games in general, but it is just definitely a case of you really, really need to read the documentation before you play them. We continue to go a long way with games that either can't cover well here or games I've already covered with additional strategy information for Civilization. Again, I've already reviewed that. Link will be in the uh, doobly-doo to the episode where I covered that. In classified information, we have a code for a two-player fighting game style minigame hidden in Mega Man 7. In our sports scene column, we have NBA Give and Go, NFL Quarter Cl Quarterback Club 96, and Frank Thomas Big Hurt Baseball covering the big three main team sports and no racing games or boxing or mar mixed martial arts or anything like that. At long last, we have the second game to really review this issue with our second MechWarrior game, but not MechWarrior 2, MechWarrior 3050, which has the camera perspective of EA Strike games. The game also has two-player co-op with one player as the pilot and the other as the gunner, and I'm actually kind of wonder why the Strike games didn't have anything like this. There's certainly enough stuff going on in some of the levels where it certainly benefits from having one guy just focus on shooting stuff and another guy focusing around maneuvering around the stuff that's trying to kill you. The article includes notes on the first three worlds. Now, disclaimer, I played this for the review with just single player. I didn't have somebody to help with the gunning, and having, an, having a designated gunner might actually make this game more playable. So, on the one hand, MechWarrior 3050 has some things going for it. It has the isometric perspective that gives you some peripheral vision that the first-person traditional mech warrior view lacks. It has a little more customization of your loadout than the Super Nintendo port of the first mech warrior does. But with the first game, it felt like with some control tweaks, like using the shoulder buttons for turning the combat cockpit or uh, or strafing, manage combat encounters more than in this game. Instead, here you are getting hit by endless strings of attacks from various sources until you destroy the objectives that are filling the sources. Airfields for airstrikes, radar towers for artillery, etc. It's like the whole issue with monsters generators in Gauntlet, but writ large. And that causes a problem because it hurts the resource management part of this game. Now, considering that the PC version of Biotech exists, 
has been on for a while, so it's had some price drops and gone on sale. It fits the setting better and has had some really good DLC. Maybe get that game instead. It's been a while since our last wrestling game. Well, now we have WrestleMania, the arcade game, which is closer to a fighting game. Actually, this presentation than pretty much all the WWF games to date. The article has move selections for each character. When it comes to games that are biting at the style of Mortal Kombat, there are some of those games, even the digitized character fighters in the Jaguar and 3 d like Wave of the Warrior, where it feels like the developers saw what Mortal Kombat was doing, and they were following in their footsteps not because they wanted the money, or not just because they wanted the money, but because they legitimately thought it was cool and wanted to try it themselves. They looked at Mortal Kombat and said, hey, that's neat, I want to do that. WrestleMania the arcade game is not one of those games. This game feels like a manager to claim, looked at the money Mortal Kombat was making, looked at some of the larger-than-life characters in the WWF at the time, particularly Undertaker and Doink, um, and went, okay, we can do that with them, went to a studio and said, hey, if we turn WWF into Mortal Kombat, we will make a lot of money. We have the Mortal, we have the WWF license, so we can do that. In the turn, the development studio looked at that, looked at Saturday Night Slam Masters, and appeared to have gone, what do we make Slam Masters with WWE wrestlers, and then do digitized sprites like Mortal Kombat, only to be forced to camp it up even further, and put more focus on strikes and involved controller motions. To be clear, the other WWF video games on the Super Nintendo and Genesis, and even for that matter the NES, were not good. This game is arguably better, but that is damning with faint praise. This feels like this game would work a lot better if it just leaned more into the Saturday Night Slam Master side of things. It's the big wrestling game, but more exaggerated. Well, this doesn't pull that off. And this also starts kind of leaning acclaimed wrestling games in the direction that will lead to WWF Warzone and WWF Attitude. Games that try to be standard wrestling games, but without including, while well, also including fighting game controller motions, with the end result of the game stumbling at what it tries to be. We have tips for how far you can get in the different difficulty levels in Doom in Counselor's Corner. Our next game of the issue is Urban Strike, the third strike game, which keeps the setting of the game in the U.S. After fighting not Saddam in the first game and not Pablo Escobar in the second game. Urban Strike puts you against a fanatical conservative ultranationalist attempting to unite various domestic terrorist groups to overthrow the United States government in order to make America great again in a game that came out before the Oklahoma City bombing, though after the Ruby Ridge standoff. So having um, villainous right-wing domestic terrorist groups in the United States is actually fairly new and novel at the time. And whoever said games weren't political. Mechanically, this plays a lot like the other two strike games we've covered thus far. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, as I feel like mechanically I've gotten a good handle about how they play. It's still got a few faults. The engine is pretty much the same as the first two, which means it's adapted from the Genesis version of the games, which means it was originally designed to play on a controller with no shoulder buttons, so you're, you know, still not able to use the shoulder buttons on the inst on the uh, Super Nintendo controller to, you know, bank the chopper or for fine rotation when you're aiming. Additionally, the game still doesn't provide the ability to save your game. You're still using passwords in between levels, which makes the game somewhat frustrating to play. While it's easy to remember game passwords these days when you can take a picture of your screen with your phone or use the screenshot functionality of your emulator or a uh, retro clone device if you got one that does that, Considering how common the ability to save your games was on Super Nintendo games at this point in the platform's life, this feels slightly absurd. Though, in looking at this, honestly, of all of EA's franchises from this period, the Strike series is the ones where I, the ones where I find myself surprised that the series has been left alive fallow so long that it's never gotten a revival in any platforms after the PS1 or N64. Um, the next two games in the series, which will be on the N64 system, um, nuclear Strike and or the Soviet Strike and Nuclear Strike, they're going to be the last games in the series, and even to this day. Next up is Vegas Stakes, a port of the NES casino game for the Game Boy. 
Vegas 6 basically lets you combine several of the handheld LCD gambling games that you could buy at a Walgreens or Rite Aid back in the day into one cartridge. Which is fine, but isn't particularly good as far as actually gam actual gambling games go. You, congratulations, you don't need to carry around four different LCD game systems. That's a net gain, sort of? And it doesn't really get put much over this in terms of over, instead of playing, say, Tetris as something to kill time. Finally, we have the Game Boy port of Mortal Kombat 3, with notes on character matchups, but no notes on how the move list has changed for the Game Boy's controls. Now, I did try to play this game for the show, but I could not get it to load. Also, going from the control seat in FAQ, apparently they mapped the block button to start for some reason, which feels incredibly impractical. This issue is now playing column, has one only one also ran this issue, uh, Porky Pig's Haunted Holiday. And in the pack watch column, we have Revolution X and Final Fight 3. So a pick of the issue of the games that I haven't already played and the games that I could play is Urban Strike. Admittedly, that is somewhat faint praise, considering the relatively small number of games I've covered this episode, but it's made up for, for the fa by the fact that it's a pretty solid game. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. However, it is a game where if you stick it in a retro clone console, you'll have a good time, and it's only going to cost you 10 bucks, which is pretty inexpensive and like a reasonable price. Like The whole Strike series in general is a really solid game series, and... They sold well enough back in the day that it's not hard to find a copy. It's like finding a copy of the original uh, Call of Duty for Modern Warfare. It's sold well. It's sold well because it's good, and it's not hard to find. Next issue, we will have more N64 coverage, though the system itself is not yet out. And we will have Earthworm Jim 2. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, Tossing me a few bucks also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.